Ready? Uh, meeting of the uh, County of Erie Board of Elections is now called to order. A roll call, please. Mr. Bale? Here. Mr. Copeland? Here. Mr. Drexel? Here. Mr. Showerman? Here. Mr. Scatella? Here. Mr. Winarski? And Mr. Horton. Chairman Horton. <laughs> Here. Also, just to note, we do have CNN and NBC zooming in on the, on the call. I see any in the NBC. Uh, at, at this portion of the meeting, uh, well, well, someone shut the door because we got someone yeah. on the phone here. And I don't want to reverb from a way out of Councilman Wynarski on the phone with us as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do we know that the attendance is here too? Uh, are there any citizens uh, desiring mm -hmm. to be heard? Are there any citizens desiring to be heard? I just stand here, right? Because my name is Freda Tepper and I live in the city of Erie. And I am, I'm a judge of elections, so I have concerns related to that and other things. I think that, as you know, I'm a great fan of the elections office and I know how hard everybody works and I know how hard the person who manages the poll workers work. Um, and I, every time I have to go through an effort to make sure I have a full complement of poll workers because sometimes I have a last minute no show where somebody drops out and I try to maintain a current list. And every time, not anyway, it appears that it would be helpful if there was a more robust system of managing the poll workers available. I think it, it's not that Sue doesn't do a good job. It's that I think the idea of having a good list and maintaining that list, something she needs a better version of than what she's working with. And if there's some way to provide some support to her so that she could have a list, because I know I've told her so-and-so is not working anymore and they keep showing up on my list. And some of the people I call who are substitutes, I say they're not interested and they keep showing on my list and, and I get the list again and they're there. So I know I have to find a substitute. Anyway, you you get the point. So that's one thing. <clears throat> um, so I found out from my friend who called about early voting and she is a person with a disability and she needs a tablet so that she can use the um, the pad and, and the, the sound thing because she's visually impaired, that there is not going to be a tablet available for the early voters. Uh, it's not just people who are visually impaired who would benefit from having a tablet available. As a judge of elections, we have innumerable people who, for one reason or another, need or prefer to use a tablet. and. Same goes with people who do early voting. I don't know what the mechanics are of making the tablet available so that it works with every precinct. And that may be the reason why it's not feasible, but a person with a disability or who has difficulty dealing with a paper ballot who chooses to vote early for whatever reason should have the access to the same um, amenities or whatever as people who vote at polls. Um, also, I am aware that both parties are planning to have um, voter protection personnel at almost every poll that they can get people to. And in the past, that hasn't been a problem. Usually somebody sits um, in a chair and they don't really hover or do anything like that. But frankly, as a judge of elections, I'm not sure exactly how to deal with them, exactly how to make it possible for them to know who's voting, what they should and shouldn't see. And I had made this suggestion. So I think that the poll worker training needs to have a more robust component, maybe some role playing of how to deal with the voter protection. I don't consider it a hostile part of the election, but I feel poorly equipped to know how to correctly deal with it. 
And again, I I think of the world of our elections staff, and I think they do an exceptional job. Um, oh, there was one more thing. My neighbor approached me because she got a postcard telling her to make sure to turn in her mail-in ballot. And I said, don't worry, they haven't been mailed yet. You haven't missed anything. But she was not aware that she can't take her husband who could not possibly make it to the drop box to she that she, she doesn't she's not allowed to to do that unless she has a form so I'm going to find out what the form is and bring it to her but I think there's a little confusion of who can drop off a ballot and what they have to do to make it possible to drop off somebody else's ballot thank you thank you are there any other citizens to be heard okay my name is Jerry Spaniel Milford. Uh, hey, I'm I'm really going to ask the question on uh, September 23rd. We were on the paper. They were asking our senators and representatives, uh, U.S., whether they would vote to certify the election between Harris and Trump, no matter who won. And there were seven reps that said didn't answer. So my question to you guys, is there going to be a problem to each one of you councilmen? Are you going to vote no matter who wins in all the races, not just the presidential race? My question is, are you going to vote to certify the election in your county? Okay, you have any other comments? We'll just say Q&A. That's it. Are there any other citizens desiring to be heard? Are there any other citizens desiring to be heard? Are there any citizens online desiring to be heard? That being said, uh, before I call for the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting, so Mr. Servidio comes down here and I appreciate his advocacy. I can tell you that the county uh, uh, has never had an issue and seven of us uh, served collectively as a board, and yes, it will be as in all the other elections that have ever taken place in Erie County. Uh, we we don't we don't foresee enough that being a problem. Thank you. Uh, I'll entertain a motion for the approval of the previous minutes. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion on any of it? Call for the question. Mr. Copeland. Yes. Mr. Drexel. Yes. Mrs. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Scatella? Yes. Mr. Winarski? Yes. Mr. Bale? Yes. Chairman Horton? Yes. Uh, we'll go to item five, which is the election report. Turn it over to Ms. Chilcott and Ms. Fernandez. Well, I just had some interesting um, numbers to share with you and an update on some of our safety modifications that we've made. As you may have noticed, we installed a customer service window and security door in the voter registration office, and a security door has badge access only now. We also installed three windows into the hallway so that we can um, allow observers and viewers from the public in the hallway there as well. Uh, and down at the voter warehouse, we've installed, uh, we modified the lobby to create a, a better viewing room, uh, had a security guard on site for logic and accuracy and uh, also had a big screen TV with other angles from a bit viewable from the logic and accuracy testing. As far as our numbers today, this is these are as of September 24th. In the primary election, we had 79,992 Democrats registered to vote. Today, we have 80,261. And in the primary, we had 68,459 Republicans registered, and today we have 70,186. So total registered today, we have 177,392 for Erie County. Since the primary election, we've also had 957 voters change their party to Republican, and 566 voters change their party to Democratic. New voters registered since the primary, we have 1,727 Republican and 269 Democrat. Uh, again, as of the 24th, we had a total mail-in ballot applications of 26,252. 
17,928 of those were Democratic, and 6,192 of those were Republican. I'm also addressing some of the misinformation and confusion. Uh, some people have reported that re they received postcards reminding people to return their ballots to the office. Those were not sent out by us, and as we stated, we have not sent the ballots. Uh, those will be those are expected to arrive in the mail the week of October 14th. It may be a little sooner than that, but that's when they're expected to arrive. Uh, there's also been some confusion because people are receiving letters and forms that are sent out to asking them to cancel their registration. Those forms are not being sent out at this time from our office. Um, if you have any questions on that, you can check your voter registration status uh, with the state or call into our office about those concerns. Um, another area of confusion uh, right now, you have uh, registrations, applications, and ballots. So be clear when people are talking, whether they're registering to vote, if they're applying for a mail-in ballot, or if they're talking about the actual ballot. A lot of parties are sending out applications right now. They're not necessarily coming from our office. So you, you may receive more than one in the mail, but that doesn't mean that it's an official mailing from this office. Um, Again, that's something that you can check with us, but you may receive multiple applications. You should only receive one ballot. Any questions, any discussion for me, members of the board? Ms. Fernandez. I think Karen just about covered it all, but I did want to say that there is an accessible mail ballot option for voters, um, and that is available at vote.pa.gov. So it is a web based ballot. Any other questions or comments? I, then I, I have a question to Ms. that might speak, speak to Ms. Tucker. So I have a question to the tab for being available for early voting. Is that something that we don't currently provide at the desk. If that's something that we could perhaps have an option. I think that that the idea or the, the terminology early in-person voting is a misnomer. And I think that's something that the Department of State is hoping to correct. So it's not an opportunity for people to come in and use a voting machine. It's an opportunity for people to come in and use a mail-in ballot. So it's a it sounds like it should be the same thing that you're seeing at the polls, but it's not. It's really, you come in, you apply for a mail-in ballot, and then you can vote and drop it in the box at that time. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that we're, we're currently going to wait on some guidance from the Department of State in, in those matters. Uh, and that, and that uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that here at Erie County uh, Board of Elections, uh, we're always looking for ways to make voting more accessible. So that's a great question. And we'll continue to like follow that with the Department of State guidelines. And being any, not being any more questions, any uh, final comments on the election detail? Seeing none, hearing none, I uh, move to item six, new business, possible certification and ballot for the 2024 general election. And unless there's any uh, commentary or questions on the ballot uh, that deserve to be answered. I'd like to entertain that motion now. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? Any reasons that it shouldn't certify? Seeing, hearing none. Uh, roll call, please, on the question. Mr. Drexel? Yes. Mr. Showerman? Yes. Mr. Scatella? Yes. Mr. Wynarski? Yes. Mr. Bale? Yes. Mr. Copeland? Yes. Chairman Horton? Yes. Item B, I'm going to do business. Discussion of ballot curing process for disabled voters. And we want to defer uh, to our legal counsel, uh, also to our chief clerk. Uh, any comments? And, 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 and it's not anything that we want to get into the weeds on suffice it to say that we've been in litigation uh, about this several things and in the end, but I will turn it over to uh, our, our solicitor. Yeah, about the curing process and the notice to cure. Uh, there have been three decisions, appellate decisions, 
Commonwealth Court decisions in Pennsylvania that have just come down this month. Uh, in fact, uh, within the past week. And they have to do with this notice to cure process. Um, both have already been appealed. So there are notice to cure appeals, two at least, pending before the Supreme Court. Uh, the most recent one, Genzinger, uh, had an interesting approach to it. And that decision, uh, written by, uh, not Caesar, but another justice, uh, was of the opinion that there is no notice to cure process, but that the election code mandates uh, any person that uh, votes and uh, the, the ballot turns out to be defective for one reason or another, undated, incorrectly dated, uh, no signature, whatever. He's saying his opinion is that because the election code already provides a mechanism uh, to provide for a provisional ballot, you're actually not curing that defective ballot because you already always had a right to, to, to vote. And it's up to the election, the election board to reject the ballot and there's a mechanism to automatically, uh, when the local election boards uh, reject a ballot or call it defective, it automatically triggers a, a an email to the state, uh, Secretary of State. Then under the election code, that person who is notified by the Secretary of State that the ballot they have is defective, they will also be notified that they have, that, that they are supposed to vote provisionally at um, if they want, if they so choose, on the day of the election. That's the most recent articulation of this notice to cure. Uh, and you could lump in with that notice to cure all of the various decisions that have gone up and down in different courts, federal and state, regarding whether the uh, dating or incorrect dating is mandatory or it's uh, immaterial and that it should not be used to disenfranchise voters. Those decisions have gone back and forth depending on the nature of the uh, composition of the board of the uh, courts. So just recently, you'll see where the Republican Party of uh, Pennsylvania and the Republican National Committee filed a King's Bench application. Uh, and I think that I've received some mail from a couple of, or emails from a couple of you. Um, that is going on now. And what's happened is because of all of these different decisions pending out there, at least three of which are in front of the Supreme Court and just as recently as this past month, uh, the Republican National Committee in this particular suit wants to jump into those suits, but it doesn't want to start at the beginning. Why? Because those decisions are already up there to the Supreme Court. They involve the same kind of issue. And uh, the RPP and the National Committee, they want to ask the Supreme Court, and they've made application to the Supreme Court, to intervene in these other appellate decisions and to come out and to force an issue on curing the right to cure, whether it is a curing process, the dating requirement. Uh, one other one other decision, by the way, and I, it was, the decision is, has involved the Zimmerman case, and I had provided copies of you with that decision, which about a month ago, which in which the Commonwealth Court ruled that the um, dating requirement was unnecessary and uh, had no material value according to the uh, Pennsylvania Constitution uh, due process clause. That was immediately appealed to the Supreme Court. And just two days ago, the Supreme Court rejected it and sent it back to the Commonwealth Court and told them to dismiss it on procedural grounds, namely that the Commonwealth Court did not have jurisdiction to hear that. And it emphasized that um, the, the reason why it's kind of complicated, but the bottom line is they had to sue each county board of election and they didn't. And they had to sue in common police court, not common law court. 
So that decision is gone. Um, but there's three more to take its place, plus the one that's <coughs> currently just filed uh, by the um, by the Republican uh, Party of Pennsylvania. As far as as far as I'm concerned, putting all of these together, um, it's incumbent upon this election board to err on the side of ensuring that whether you treat it as a defective ballot and, and put out a notice of cure, it's incumbent upon the election board at the very least, whether it's whether it's a dating issue or some other defect, number one, to segregate those, to call them defective, um, to alert the Secretary of, of uh, the Commonwealth, and then to contact, like we've done in the last few years, to contact the voter to advise them of their right to file a provision. One, that your ballot is defective. Two, you have a right to vote provisionally at the on the day of the election at the polls. That's the history of those issues. And I think was, was three that you, uh, uh, we, I think we took the additional step of posting uh, those and allowed uh, that court case and allowed them to correct them. Well, and they're yeah, it, it's just looping them all into one. And so I don't really want to get all technical into the weeds. I'd suffice it to say that uh, the, the election process is it's not an issue that's just indigenous to Erie County, but uh, that we remain uh, in litigation on a number of fronts. Uh, we move forward uh, at the pace of the Department of State. Well, no, not in the no, courts. No, in fact, uh, the, the one case says no, Department of State, you don't have the authority. The authority is with the various uh, boards of election. The, the state is a guidance mechanism. And that's what we okay. do. We follow the guidance that, uh, as closely as we can with the Department of State. Uh, and so, and, and, we, and we lean on them. Uh, so uh, any uh, precedent setting things or any, uh, we're blessed to have you here as our solicitor, but we lean on this on the solicitor. Uh, uh, item C. Free canvas and canvas and mail ballots. You want to talk about that? Go ahead. Tell us what your, your, your issue is. Uh, currently, what we had approved, what this board had approved in 2020, was uh, allowing the authorized representatives to be in the same room where we're pre canvassing and canvassing the votes on election day. Um, and since that time, that was four years ago, we have exhausted all of the room in our election office because we have purchased such large equipment. In fact, some of the equipment um, is it's it's so it's so bulky that there's it's hard for even our staff to get around. So introducing more people into this situation on election day, we're concerned that there's just there's not the space. There are additional security issues that we didn't have in 2020. We've made adequate room so that people can see from the hallway what we're doing. The fishbowl is right there where the windows are, where the tabulation will be occurring. Uh, we would additionally put a live stream camera uh, as we did for logic and accuracy so that we could have an overflow room in here, uh, use the screen on the TV there for people to observe from another vantage point, um, the actual part where people are unfolding the ballots and, and that process. So it's something for us to consider because times have changed, space has changed, security has changed since those uh, rules were passed in 2020. Time has changed and, and I'm a strong advocate of keeping our staff uh, safe and unintimidated. Uh, I don't like the fact uh, that there's stuff laying around uh, that people have could potentially view uh, it has nothing to do with what they're there to watch for and I don't think that in this environment anyone should be placed under that level uh, and I've seen election night in here time and time again uh, we don't even have space for us in there for an office so it's really like a no issue as far as me all these election integrity grant upgrades and security upgrades have uh, lent itself uh, to helping us solve that problem. In, in my opinion, my colleagues have welcomed the four stairs, but 
uh, and, and incidentally, the security window at the glass and all of that stuff looks really, really nice. And having polled the staff in there, they all feel really a lot more secure about it. But if, if any, you know, how do any of you feel? This is a question as to whether we're allowing the authorized representative in the physical room next to the machine versus 10, 15 foot back behind the viewing window. Right. Correct. Nobody was allowed in the fishbowl previously. They were allowed outside the fishbowl, but within the office setting. What we're asking for security purposes and in line with the recommendation from Homeland Security is that those people remain in the hallway so that they can view through the windows. We're also asking that additionally to make sure that people have a proper view of what's happening, that we put a live camera and it would be like a Zoom where they could come in here and watch the TV from the seating in here or in chambers. And one of the court cases also is, is that we uh, started out with the drop box, I believe, but we require uh, to have video footage of all of this. If there's any, any issue about it. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I mean, obviously the, the changes we've made and what we're looking to do with adding the camera and the live stream, I think we're actually giving more access, maybe even a clear access point, like with the camera down and all that stuff. We keep everybody in the office safe. We keep, you know, the possibility of there being any sort of election tampering or anything from the outside person. And and uh, I, I'm i very supportive of this, so. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, there's been a lot of changes. Many more people vote. There's mail-in voting. Um, people are more educated about voting. Uh, one thing that hasn't changed is the law. If you read the law, the law says that the two representatives, one from the party and one from the candidate, are to remain in the room. Uh, so while we are you know, progressing and intending to provide more access and uh, given the contemporary situation that we have, we have a lot to contend with. And there are very many people uh, out there who like to use the law, uh, any piece of the law, even out of context in order to make their point and their argument. So I would not be surprised if, I, well, number one, I think that I'd like to review and I haven't seen the windows in that and looked at the room that's available or not available. But I think we have to meet some kind of accommodation because I don't. we don't want those people that are gonna demand to be in the room arguing, hey, the law says we can be here. So that's, that's gonna have to be addressed and resolved another time. Well, well that's fair. Uh, but at, at the same token, uh, the seven of us are charged to make the decision uh, on the procedures outlining the election. Here and I'm going to always err on the side of safety and security of our people, and, I'm, and they can add that to the list of uh, court cases, I guess. But I'm going to err on the side and want to ask for support in in, uh, in supporting our staff and our clerk to uh, to uh, you know provide them with the opportunity to walk and work in a safe working environment. That's the one that's worth me going to court over. Uh, well, Chair, I would suggest we're going to have another meeting on some of these rules as well. I would suggest that we postpone any kind of vote on that. I mean, it happens to be the law. There's no vote involved here. Okay. And it's not a, we're not challenging anything of the law or anything because this happens to be the Board of Elections. Uh, they happen to be our staff, and we happen to be in a confined space, and it seems like I just really see a lot of, uh, of uh, any pushback, certainly not anything that we're uh, uh, voting on. It's a procedural thing. And, and for that, we're fully capable and qualified to, to make those decisions. Do we have a tentative date on, a, on our next meeting? No. We would still we have. We still have our regular meeting, but. The, the reality of it is, is we're in court session. I mean, where is the time of season where, to Tom's point, everything is being litigated. And so uh, uh, we're moving and hoping uh, that this is the last, people are still being asked to take be taken off ballots. I'm here or anything. So, but uh, I have no qualms about 
providing them access. They never were allowed in the room. <laughs> Uh, that's always been a secure facility and to say into I think it uh I think it could say tomato, we could say tomato, but they've never been allowed in the fishbowl. Uh, they've been allowed to walk freely uh, throughout our office, uh, our office space, uh, oftentimes even through the door that leads to our office, uh, leads to our break room. <laughs> and so I I I think on election night, we all know what it looks like around election night here. Uh, even when we did, uh, and, there, and there are changes. Uh, when we first started, there wasn't a lot. I remember we had mail-in ballots piled up all through the hallway for weeks. Mr. Chair, I, I generally agree with you on the security arrangement, and uh, it's really important to make sure that our workers are safe. However, uh, I, I do think it'd be prudent to at least table the conversation until the, the next meeting so we could have some uh, deeper uh, deeper look into the background of the law. If we if we were to schedule a board of elections for October 10th, that would be two weeks now. Um, that would give us sufficient time to consider a resolution to that effect prior to the election. And also, um, just it would give up an opportunity to research how other counties have interpreted the law on that. And there is guidance from the state as the two of you have uh, indicated. And there's we have guidance from our solicitor and we have guidance from the state. And there's the way that this has been practiced in other counties. So it would give you, if you want, a look at 67 counties. There, there's nothing new. I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you know when Homeland Security did their walk through and their evaluation were they well versed in the law election laws there because this was their recommendation right right so i mean i'm sure that their area of experience even though they were tasked with working with election offices across the country that it was from a security standpoint and not from an election law standpoint they aren't attorneys they're security personnel. Right. But I, I think that's another reason that we should wait. Sure. Well, two things. There's nothing to table because there isn't a resolution or orders or anything to vote on. Uh, if you're asking that we break off discussion here uh, and, 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 and move to adjournment, that's one thing. Uh, but there's nothing to table. So in between our now and our next meeting, feel free to have as much conversation about it as you want to, and it'll come back. And uh, I'm going to ask that, that uh, our clerk prepare something, a resolution uh, preemptively uh, to support this. Uh, and if we get some type of uh, ruling that says we can't, or we shouldn't, or we ain't, or we won't, then you still have it prepared. Uh, then we follow it up. Uh, if there's not anything uh, else from the good of the order to say that we can't, or shouldn't do that, or we put it to a vote and come here, vote it up, vote it down. So, but, uh, you know, unless there's any other commentary. Just have question. one question. The live stream will record that, and we have the ability to save that live uh, stream from there. We haven't had that conversation. It was, uh, we did not record it during logic and accuracy. It was just a live feed. I can see for logic and accuracy, but I'm thinking for something like this, if we're going to have it available, then we probably would, should have the capability to. Sure. It's going to cover the safe. same area that we already have cameras, security cameras in place. So internally, we have those cameras. Uh, those cameras are not connected to any way for the public to see what's happening. So this is just an additional camera. Um, covering the same office space on a live feed, right? But we have the capability and the requirement to maintain the footage, which is one of the other cases that we're going to Unless there's anything else for the good of the order, I'm going to call for adjournment. Thank you all. Thank you. Um,